start chapter 17. Chapter 17 is just the basics of blood. Okay? What does it do and what's in it? That's all that's in chapter 17. When we are going to talk about blood pressure and the names of all the blood vessels, that's chapter 19. We're going to Oh yeah, you know, you, well, you know some of them do. You're, you're carotid, you're jugular, you just never thought about it like that, right? So that's later. Chapter 17 is just what's in it, what does it do, okay? Functions of blood. Before you look at it, I stand in front of it. What does blood do? Transports oxygen. That is the number one most important thing your blood does, okay? The transporting or distributing of materials is the number one job of your blood. It doesn't just transport and distribute oxygen. It also sends hormones around, right? We just talked about hormones. That's the way your hormones travel. Just almost as important as oxygen is transporting around the waste products. Number one waste product is carbon dioxide, right? It carries carbon dioxide one direction and oxygen the other direction. It's just as that your blood does for you, you may not automatically think of are the regulation and protection functions of blood. Your blood regulates your body temperature. How does it do that? Have you ever noticed that sometimes areas of your body get hot, right? Fever, things like that. That's when you have more blood flowing, more blood flowing to an area that's damaged, for example. It's trying to heal, so the blood's obviously bringing something there, right? It's bringing immune system cells and uh, sugars to help make more energy. It's bringing things to the area. That's where you, why you get it there. Now, what we're not going to talk about yet, but what your blood also does is help you maintain your pH and the volume, fluid volumes in your body. But that's it, that's urinary system. We're going to get there, okay? And then protection. It protects you from blood loss and infection. Talk about blood loss in this chapter. Infection will come when we get to chapter 20. 21, chapter 21, immune system, okay? All right, so what is blood made of? Your blood has two main part elements. Formed elements are the solid stuff in your blood. And most people think of blood as liquid. Well, it is mostly liquid, right? Because the ground substance is, is made up of mainly fluid. But there are actually quite a few formed elements, solid stuff that's alive in your blood. You have erythrocytes leukocytes, okay, and platelets. Erythrocytes and leukocytes sound horrible, but they are things you already know. That's just the proper name. Erythrocytes are red blood cells. Leukocytes are white blood cells, okay? So that's just the proper name of them. Platelets are just little pieces, and we're going to look at all three of them. The plasma, as I said, is mainly water, but there's lots of other stuff. And I didn't list it all. It's all in the table in your textbook, table 17.1, I believe. But the stuff that's in your plasma is stuck in the water. Okay? These represent something that is not alive. If you've ever seen somebody have plasma taken, if you've ever given blood or given plasma, it's a pretty different process. If you took just a test tube full of blood and spun it really fast, it would be red at the bottom kind of a yellowy color on the top. The red at the bottom is all of the solid stuff, the red blood cells and the white blood cells sink into the bottom because they're heavier, they're bigger. At the top is the plasma. Okay? So when you give you just go give blood, they just poke a needle in you and they take your blood out. When you give plasma, they put a needle in you and take it blood out. It goes through a machine that separates these two things. It takes your plasma and then it puts the rest of it back into your body. It's um, some. I'm glad there's people that do it, but I wouldn't never give plasma. It doesn't look like it doesn't look like fun. The last time I gave blood, this poor little guy had been sitting there for like an hour giving plasma next to me, and the machine backed up, and he ended up they couldn't take any of his stuff, and it backed up and started backing up towards his needle. And it started swelling in his arm. It was horrific. He had this big bruise. It was horrible looking. So ever since that, I thought, oh my God, I'd never give plasma. But I'm glad there are people that will because it looks pretty bad. Okay, so that's your two different parts. And we're going to talk about each of these parts as we go through. Okay, 
The first one is the erythrocyte. So I put this picture back on your slide, and we looked at this picture back in Chapter 4, right? You could all look at that and tell me that was blood, right? Okay. When we look at this picture, the little light pink circles, those are the erythrocytes. Those are your red blood cells. They look darker on the outside and lighter on the inside. That's because they have this shape to them. It's what we call biconcave. It's thicker on the outside, and then it dips in on the inside. The reason your red blood cells can have this shape is because they're really neat cells. They're the only eukaryotic cell on Earth that does not have a nucleus. They are basically just shells with hemoglobin on the inside of them. We're going to look at hemoglobin in a minute. That's pretty much the only thing in there. And I always think this is kind of neat to write down because most people just don't think of it this way. They don't have organelles either. Well, most people say that's just because they don't need them. What would happen if a red blood cell had mitochondria? Your red blood cells are, have hemoglobin. They're carrying oxygen. Your oxygen is used to make energy. Right? So if they had a mitochondria, they would just use the oxygen they were trying to carry to other places. So it just doesn't make any sense for them to have organelles. That's why they're empty. They're just, they're just the process by which we make red blood cells is called hematopoiesis. Sounds horrible, right? Okay. We're not going to talk about all these phases. But I want you to see, inside of your body, you have something called a hematopoietic stem cell. You have those in your bone marrow. As adults, you still have those. Okay, a lot of people hear the word stem cell, and they automatically think just from a fertilized egg. That's the only place you have stem cells. Not true. Stem cell just means undifferentiated cell. The cell can become more than one type of cell. So this hematopoietic stem cell, if it starts going this direction through this pathway, it can make red blood cells. As an adult, if you have these types of stem cells, you should automatically be able to think, oh, well, that means I probably can still make stuff. You constantly make red blood cells. Red blood cells, after about the 120-day mark on average, they're not good anymore. They can't carry oxygen efficiently. So your body, your liver, destroys those old red ones. It actually is pretty neat the way they destroy them. They break it down into stuff we can, the liver can use to make something called bile that we'll talk about a little later. Okay, we never throw anything away. If we can reuse it, we reuse it. Okay? All right, so take home message. Red blood cells. They don't have any organelles. Only thing in them is hemoglobin. They're made from that hematopoietically remaking them in your body. Okay? All right? So what is hemoglobin? It's the only thing in our red blood cell. It must be pretty important. So this little picture right here is kind of showing you the cheesy drawing of how it's, how it's a protein. It's made of four different proteins stuck together. Okay? Proteins have to twist up and wad up into a perfect little structure. So you have four different proteins. Each protein has a heme in the middle. Okay? And here's the word if you can't understand my, my southern accent. All right? So it has a heme in it. Every heme has one iron molecule. So that means have in your red blood cell has four irons. That's a really important number to know because the iron is what the oxygen attaches to. So if this is a hemoglobin in our red blood cell, it's going to have one oxygen bound here, one oxygen bound here, one here, and one here. Okay? And it actually binds to that iron in the center. This is the preferred way that hemoglobin likes to look. It likes to have four oxygens bound to it. Okay? There are times when you'll see a carbon dioxide bound to hemoglobin, but the carbon dioxide does not bind to the iron, which should kind of make sense to you because we really need our hemoglobin to bind oxygen and take it places, right? So if the oxygen was competing with the carbon dioxide, the hemoglobin wouldn't be sure which way it should do that. So the carbon dioxide doesn't usually bind to the hemoglobin, just every now and then. Usually you have your oxygen bound. Okay. I love to ask the question on a test. 
how many oxygen molecules can bind to one hemoglobin molecule? How many oxygen? Four. Okay. Some of you said four, but y'all were like, oh, everybody else said one. I don't want to say it. Four oxygens to one hemoglobin. Okay. Also, I could ask you a different way. How many iron molecules are found in one hemoglobin? Four. I could ask it either way. Really important to know. Okay. So that was the red blood cells. They transport oxygen because they have hemoglobin in them. The leukocytes are part of your immune system. They protect your body from invasion of anything that's not supposed to be in there. We are going to go over these five cells in a little more detail, a little later. Understanding of what the five different types of white blood cells do. These white blood, and if I flip back just real quickly, let me show you. So if we go back to this picture, these big funny looking guys, those are your white blood cells, your leukocytes. There's a very important difference between leukocyte and erythrocyte. Red blood cells are not supposed to leave your blood. They're in your blood. Leukocytes, if they're needed somewhere besides your blood, they can crawl out of your blood vessel and go into a specific area where they're needed. You've got to understand that for it to make sense when we talk about what they do. Okay? And this process, diapodesis, that's them moving out of the blood. We're going to see that word Thursday when we go over inflammation. We're going to see that word again. So what do these five white blood cells do? The first three are grouped together because they look grainy under the microscope. Okay, grainy just meaning they like they have little dots in them. The first one is a neutrophil, and that's this one right here on this picture. He's got his nucleus looks funny. It's called it's multi-lobed. Okay, your neutrophils are the most numerous, the most important of all of your basic white blood cells. They are phagocytes. What does phagocytosis mean? to eat something else. These are your immune system cells that they see a bacteria that's not supposed to be there. They grab it, eat it, and destroy it. Okay? They're the first ones to attack. You send in the big guys that can immediately start killing stuff. Your eosinophils, which are right here, all right, they have kind of the bilobed nucleus and the red in the background. Eosinophils attack parasitic worms. Okay. If you've never had micro, you may not realize how common worms are. We all have had a parasitic worm in our body at some point in our life. You just didn't know it because you didn't see it in the toilet floor. You flushed it and it left your body. Okay. We have cells devoted just to killing worms that come in our body. They're called eosinophils. Now, of course, it's not a cell that goes and eats a worm. It just goes and sits next to the worm and makes the worm die. And then you poop the worm out. They usually live in your intestines. Okay. The third one, basophils. That's this guy in the third picture. Basophils have histamine in them. Okay. So the way this works is something comes in your body that's not supposed to be there. The basophil is the tattletale. That's why I always remember it. He sees it and starts releasing histamine, telling all the other cells, hey, I found something. Y'all come help me destroy it. You can't immediately destroy the other ones to come. He also makes things like your nose run. Why? To be to bother you? No. Because if there's something in there that needs to come out, if it starts running, it's more likely to come out. Okay? Have any of you ever taken an antihistamine? Yeah, we live in Mississippi, right? Everybody's going to say, yeah, I have. If you've taken Benadryl, you've taken an antihistamine. The way that works, something like pollen comes in your body and your basophil gets confused. Your basophil says, oh my God, pollen, this is not supposed to be here, and starts releasing histamine, screaming for the other immune system cells to come help him. And your other cells get there, this is just pollen. And they leave and go away, but it has released that histamine and made you feel sick. It's an allergic reaction. Okay? That's what allergies are, just your basophil getting confused. Okay? That's why some of us could sit here and sniff and snort pollen all day long, and we would never sneeze. Our basophils don't react to it. Other people can just be around something, and their basophils start reacting. Mm -hmm. 
No, it's a little bit different in the EpiPen. It, I'll explain it to you after class. They're very neat. She's asking about the EpiPen. It's not necessarily epinephrine. It does have some epinephrine in it, but that's just to make your heart beat a little faster to get things moving faster in your body. That's not really the allergic reaction fixer in the EpiPen. Okay? So I'll explain it to you a little later. All right, really quickly, let me tell you about the last two. They are called monocytes, excuse me, lymphocytes and monocytes in the picture. Lymphocytes are first and monocytes are last. Lymphocytes are your T cells and B cells. We're going to talk about those later. They are the specific part of your immune system. Very complex. Monocytes leave the blood, and then we call them macrophages. They are very, very phagocytic. Your, your macrophages help your neutrophils destroy things that aren't supposed to be there. Okay? The last one of these are the platelets. I don't even really, it takes 30 seconds to explain. What does a platelet do? helps your blood clot. They're just little pieces of cells. They come from that same hematopoietic stem cell, but they go a different route, break up into little pieces, and if they find a place in your blood vessel that is broken, they start binding to it, clumping together, and clot the blood so you don't bleed to death. That's their job. Real simple, right? Okay. So that's exactly where I wanted to stop today.